Loving God, we give you thanks for this day and for the opportunities that it provides. We give you thanks for friendship and fellowship and the opportunity to learn more about you, learn more about ourselves, learn more about each other. We ask that you bless this food to our use and us to your service. Always keep us mindful of the needs of others. In Christ's name, amen. 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 All right, this is a good crowd. We've got some casseroles and stuff in the back. We don't normally have that, and Rebecca told me that's just kind of for the kickoff. Um, we're not going to do that every week. Um, but, like, if it becomes a thing and you all show up and want to start bringing casseroles and stuff, we can figure that out. But this is, like, just to set expectations. Um, feel free to go back and get some more fruit or some more casseroles. So I know um, several of y'all are here for different reasons. Some of y'all are here is because you're here every week, no matter what we talk about, which is awesome. Some of you are here because you're new to the congregation and you're wondering who we are, what we're doing, things like that. We'll get to some of that. Some of you are here because you're interested in confirmation, which is a whole deal, and we can talk more about that later. Um, but, but this is the first part of confirmation prep. For people who want to get confirmed, once we know when the bishop's coming, which we don't know, I, I've been trying to talk to some bishop sisters and be like, come on, just get them to come in town, please. Um, yeah, call her right now. Thank you. Um, but once we once we have that schedule, we'll have the, the final stuff, right? So this is kind of the core, if you're interested in confirmation. We'll talk more about that later on. But before we get started, um, what do y'all want to learn over these next four weeks, right? These four weeks, we're going to talk about four key ideas. Today, baptism, Bible, Eucharist, and prayer. Those are four, like, really big topics, and we're not going to learn everything about all of those. But in those four topics, or in other things, like why am I wearing this black thing still? Or why do we have a best treatment? What questions do you have about our faith, about the church in general, about St. Martin specifically? What questions do you have? We'll see if we can answer them in the coming weeks. Thomas. Oh. No, no, like I didn't know if I should ask yet or not. I know, didn't know where you were going. Yeah, but... I'm going to put okay. questions on the board. We're not, I'm not going to answer them right now. This isn't like <laughs> Stump a Priest. Although we are going to schedule some Stump a Priest time. Yeah. What question do you have? Um, I'd like to know more about the Nicene Creed. All right, Gavin, you Yay! work on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's Gavin's. Is it? Yes, it's awesome. Fun stuff I'm going to do, hard stuff he's going to do. <laughs> yeah. In the church being received. What does reception mean? Yeah. That's an easy one. If you've been concerned, confirmed by a bishop in another tradition, you would be received. So if you're Catholic, if you're Lutheran, if you're Methodist, and you're coming to us, that's reception. And is that the same as confirmation? Then? No, because you've already been confirmed. Functionally, for us, it's the same. You become a confirmed communicant of the Episcopal Church. You've already been confirmed. It looks the same, but a bishop has already put their hands on you. And so there is a distinction. But yeah, if you, if you come from Catholic, Methodist, some Lutherans, I was Lutheran, but I was confirmed as a kid by a pastor. So when I became Episcopalian, I had to be confirmed again. Received. No, I had to be confirmed because I, a bishop didn't lay their hands on me. So we can talk more about those specifics later. King. What makes us different from some of the other branches like um, Lutheran or Methodist or... Uh, we're right, they're wrong. <laughs> well, I know that, but why are they wrong? Come to my sermon. We're the cool kids table. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about denominations. What other questions do we have? Kids in the back, what questions do y'all have? None. None? None. Y'all have all done it. Like that, some of y'all, y'all been through this before. What else? Yeah. Can you get like an idea of the vision or dynamics from the top down? Because I know what they A church org chart? Basically. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, we're going to have two. So we're talking mainly theology in September, right? Baptism, Bible, Eucharist, prayer. In November, we're going to have several weeks where we look more at structure. That's another part of the confirmation if you're going to do that. But it's a chance where we're going to talk one week about the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Communion, right? The feast day of, um, who was it? Mary? No. What feast day did it end up being? Oh, it was the day that somebody died. It's the day that, yeah, one of the queens during the Reformation, the one who kept trying to pull us back from Protestant or Catholic, she died. We're going to celebrate her feast day by talking about why we're Protestant. Okay, so yeah. So, 
So yeah. Gavin and I need to study before that oh, week. Lady die. But so in November we're gonna have a week about like the broad church. We're gonna also have on the feast of Saint Martin, November tenth, we're gonna talk about Saint Martin's and the structure here. How are we organized as a body? So we'll get to those. What about the difference in Bible yeah, we'll get to that next week. Bibles. What translations should you read? What should you stay away from? Uh, spoiler, the best Bible is the one you will read. Outside of that, I don't care about translations. Yeah, back here. You can say evangelism. <laughs> you can say that word in here. Yeah, we'll, we'll call that evangelism. Evangelism isn't just telling people about Jesus. Evangelism can also be telling them about a way to understand Jesus and how it might be different than than what they've done. So, yeah, we can get to that maybe. We will get to that at some point. What else? Y'all know everything else? Gavin, what do you want to learn? Yeah, why do we have bishops? Yeah, that goes to the org chart. Bishop, I don't, why do we have bishops? Why? Not just, not just what. Why? Why? Right? 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 Why? Right? Why? Why? Right? Life would be a lot easier if we didn't want to. Y'all just hire me and like I just run this joint. We're just like, let's go off. I love it. This is being recorded. Hi, Andy. <laughs> what else do we want to learn? Like, don't be afraid to ask the questions. Or like, tell the person next to you to ask the question if you're afraid to be embarrassed. Yeah. Maybe not for this class, but they used to have specific meals and like... Specific what? Oh, fast. Yeah, fast. You go to Camp Allen and you get fast. I was at Camp Allen, our diocesan camp. You go there on a Friday, you're going to eat catfish. So fast. We can talk about that for sure. Sam? Is Lent an official thing or is that something that was made up along the way? That's a good question. Um, so we'll talk about the liturgical calendar. Lent is not in the Bible. So what does it mean to be official? That's another question. What makes things official? Is it no, biblical? Is it tradition? Is it, yeah? How about confession? Some, in some churches. Tell us, how have you screwed up? <laughs> Versus general confession. Yeah. Before, yeah, absolutely. Before, uh, we'll get to that. I mean, that's, we're going to talk a little bit today about sacraments in general. And confession is a, a sacramental penitential act, um, it's something you can do. So we can talk about that. We'll talk about sacraments. Confession. You can do. All should. No, sorry. All may. Some should. None must. Is how we view confession. And, and why? So then. Why? Yeah. Because we're all broken. No, no, why should we? Oh. So why don't we like the Catholic Church? Yeah. All hundred years ago, you no. had to go to confession. Before you could have communion. Mass. Yeah. And uh, some of it's. Fridays only have fish. Yeah. And you used to not eat before you had communion. Right. So those kind of traditions. Yeah. And like we can talk about personal piety. I don't eat solid food. I drink in the morning before 8.30 church, but I don't eat solid food before I receive communion. That's a personal thing. Like no one, like it's not Bishop when he watches this and brings up a Title IV violation against me. <laughs> uh, which we can talk about Title IV. Let's talk about Constitution and Canons. Title IV is what governs clergy discipline. So when I joke about that, it's like the, univer the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Like, <laughs> if I'm court-martialed, it's a Title IV. What else? All right, this is a good start. We'll keep adding to this board, and we'll cross things off when we get to them. And so, like, come up here and um, write things on the big board, or shoot us an email. Sean, Casey, I told him one time, email me any question you have. Maybe the worst mistake I've ever made. <laughs> He's in choir. He emails me weekly. And I love it. He emails both me and Gavin, and neither one of us reply immediately. I think we're like, which one of us is going to take this one? Right. And other folks, if you have any kind of question about anything, email me about it. 
I'm happy to talk. I've met with several of you over coffee to talk about. If you have questions about why are we doing this? What is this? Like, we don't just have to learn the stuff in the class. I'm happy to have conversations. Sam. As Episcopalians, do we include the Apocrypha in our Bible? <laughs> yeah. Where did I put Bible? Apocrypha. What do you mean? Depends on what you buy. Depends on what you buy. Depends on what you mean by include. See, like, I'm the best at answering questions with more questions. <laughs> I learned it from Jesus. <laughs> Rebecca. But are we checking, like, the fabric makeup of our clothes before we wear them? Right? Because that's in there with the same stuff that other people use for other things. Yeah, people right. Used to bang people over the head yeah. There's a great scene in the show The West Wing, which I've written an entire Sunday school curriculum on The West Wing in seminary because I love the show so much. There's this one scene where Jed Bartlett, who's the president, who apparently is on CBS Sunday morning this morning. It's unclear if he's Martin Sheen or if he's President Bartlett in this interview, but I'm going to watch it. He has this scene where someone's quoting Bible verses at him. He's like, Yeah, you're going scripture in verse. But then he's like, my brother's a farmer, but he doesn't plant his crops one row and then another. Is he going to hell? Do I have to kill him? He's like, my other kid wears clothes that are mixed fibers. Do I have to stone them myself? What about the football team that touches the skin of a dead pig? Who's going to do that? And so we'll talk about how we interpret the Bible because all that stuff, some of it we laugh at, right? We're laughing about all this stuff. But there's other things in those same chapters that we, we even still take seriously. So what do we do with stuff like that? You put on your costume too, Lynn. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We're calling this Christianity 101. And some of this, we did this last year too, if you remember. And some of you have been Episcopalians longer than I've been alive. And so um, this isn't just a beginner's class. It's a good chance for us to um, learn again and talk more deeply uh, and from a different perspective, right? Because things that we thought we knew, things that I thought I, I knew everything as a 20-year-old. Right? I, when I was Sam, I knew everything. I didn't have to ask questions. Now I know which questions to ask, and so I know, I, I know a lot less now than I did as a teenager. Right? And so we approach things differently as we're in different seasons of life. And so that's a chance. Every fall, we're going to do this. As long as I'm here, you're going to get tired of it. We're going back to the basics. And so um, we're going to look at that. And another thing, so we'll talk about confirmation. Confirmation, a lot of it's for youth or people coming from our tradition. Confirmation is a public profession of faith is what it is, right? Uh, many of you were baptized as babies maybe, and you had no say in the matter. Like someone handed you to me, and I poured water over you. You had no say in the matter. Confirmation is your say in the matter. And so it's your chance to, either you were baptized as a baby, and now you say, yeah, this isn't just my mom and dad stuff anymore. This isn't just because grandma brought me here. This is, I, I'm bought in. I want to stand up and say, I believe this stuff. That's your chance as confirmation. A lot of, that's why youth around the age of like teenager-ish, when we say, you know, it's time to grow up and do that. Then, we, yeah. What if you're baptized as like a 12-year-old? Do you make a choice and you go through the classes? Yeah, and so you still would be confirmed. That would be the next step in our tradition because the confirmation, it's, it's both the public affirmation, but it's also a sacramental act by the bishop. The bishop will come, he'll put his hands on you, and he'll say a thing. You don't have to. We have lots of people who aren't. They just don't choose not to be, and that's okay. It's an opportunity to do it, but it's like not, you're not prevented from anything. Well, if you want to be a priest, you have to be confirmed. So if that's an uh, incentive to not be confirmed, because then they can never like send you off to seminary, I don't blame you. Um, but everything in the church is open to you if you're baptized. It used to be confirmation was a barrier. It's not anymore. Um, and so people, if you're baptized as an adult, if you're baptized as a teenager, whatever, the next step if you want to make that public affirmation would be confirmation. Uh, beyond that, if you've been baptized and confirmed, Mary Beth, you did this last year, right? You were received. No. That was reaffirmed. You were reaffirmed. We talked about reception. Reaffirmation, that's the altar call, right? You know, in some traditions, people get baptized multiple times. People stand up and they do all, and that's, that's the way they understand it. That's not how we understand it. But that public 
I've done this before and I want to do it again. Like that's a real desire and we have that. It's called reaffirmation. So some of you in here, maybe you've been baptized, maybe you've been confirmed, but maybe something in your life is like, yeah, you're doubling down. You're doing that again. So you can do something called reaffirmation. That's the three things that happen when the bishops come. Right? Confirmation, reception, reaffirmation. So that's kind of where we are. Look at that. Boom. We marked something off the list. And we can talk more. We'll talk more specifics when we get down to like actually getting ready for it. But Christianity 101, we're going to get started. And it all starts in our tradition. Let me move this thing over here. With baptism. So, who here was baptized as a baby and don't remember it? As a baby, yeah. Who here remembers their baptism? Yeah, how old were y'all? Just shout it out. Eight, 12, 20, how old? 25. 25, yeah, that's awesome. 16. 16, 12, yeah, so different tradition, right? So then that gets down, we practice what we call infant baptism. I was baptized at eight days old. Um, and so we, we view baptism as something that, like, it's grace. Complete, unmerited favor, right? There's nothing you can do that gets you ready for baptism. If you've been baptized here with me, there's no training, there's no prep, there's nothing. Some churches do have that. We don't because there's literally nothing that stands between us in our tradition, in our way we understand it. We get it from a couple pieces of scripture. Philip encounters this guy on the road, this Ethiopian eunuch, and they talk about the scriptures a little bit. And the Ethiopian eunuch's like, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And Philip's right, you're right, nothing. Let's go find some water and do it. There's nothing. And then there was this Roman centurion who, the other piece in the scripture is he gets baptized and it says his whole household was baptized. That household would have included his wife, probably all of his kin, his enslaved people, probably, and his kids, even babies, the whole household. Nothing prevented them, right? So we find our understanding of baptism from that. Other traditions, they have what's called, that. so we're called infant baptism. The other thing is called believer's baptism. And that's a different understanding. We can argue about that over a beer or a cup of coffee maybe. Um, but that's the thing that you have to understand a little bit, right? We're never going to know what's going on. Right? We'll talk about that. I have a degree in this stuff. I don't know what happens in baptism. And so we can't expect an 8-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 25-year-old to know what's going on. But in believer's baptism, you at least get to have a say, which I see some merit in that. right? And so that's the understanding of that as well. It's like you as an 8-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 16-year-old, a 25-year-old, you can say, I want to get baptized. And then it's a response to something, right? the believer's baptism. You believe and then you're baptized. That's the other way of understanding it. So we'll talk, okay, take a pause. What questions about baptism before I just start lecturing? Yes. Does any Christian baptism count? If it's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and it's done with water. There's two criteria, right? There has to be water. Can't just be like King in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Boom, you're baptized. I just baptized you again. I can do that. No, it doesn't work. It has to include water. It used to have to include living water, right? Way back in the day, you had to find something that was flowing. And so, like, everything we've done here used to be invalid because the only time it's flowing is when it goes from the jug into the bowl, right? But we've done away with that. The bigger thing is the Trinitarian formula. There's some branches of Pentecostalism, Mormon Church, some other um, denominations that don't use in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. They, what did they, they baptize just in the name of Jesus or just uh, in the name of God? Sometimes it depends. Um, like there was a point in the early 2000s in the Church of God in Christ where they would say in the name of the Holy Spirit I baptize you. Yeah. Um, and so that was, you know, in some, in some ways about it. And yeah, and this is something, right? Like we used to kill each other over this exact question. Right. And so, if you've been baptized in the Episcopal Church, you've been baptized in the mainline traditions, right? You were baptized with water and in the name of the Trinity. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are the two criteria. Right. 
And so if you're coming from a Mormon tradition, Pentecostal, um, some of those types of things, we need to have a conversation. And sometimes you never know, right? I was eight days old. How do I know what the guy said? Right? And so I'm trusting. Maybe this whole thing's invalid. I'm sorry. Um, but some of us were trusting, but like we have a different understanding now. And so if, if that's a question, we can talk about that over coffee and, and have a conversation about that. Yeah, Christine. Why, why do some religions uh, require a full immersion for baptism? Because that's how it was practiced back in the day. Right? And there's some things we do solely because it's the way they used to do it. And it had, right? And theologically, I like it a lot better. In the church renovations, like this is not a hill I'm willing to die on. I would love if we had a, a tank. I would love it. But like, Alter Guild would kill me. Um, because I love it, right? Because an infant, right? Because we'll get to the understanding. No, we'll just go there right now. In baptism, we die. Right? That's the way we understand baptism. We die. Our old self, our old Adam is the way it's talked about. The flesh, it goes down into the water and it dies. And we come up and we're a new creation. You're not going to kill somebody by sprinkling them with water. Right? Is the purpose of baptism to, to save the soul for eternity? Because there's some beliefs in religions that say, you know, an infant or a child needs to be baptized. If they should die, their soul... Got to wash that sin off of them. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what is, is there a, our, in our church the belief on baptism to save the soul for eternity? Or uh, Good question. So, baptism is an initiation of inclusion, forgiveness, and uni union. Like, we have an understanding that it does three things. It probably does more than that, right? Like, we talked about, if you were in here in the class, about um, what happened on the cross, and we talked about, like, four things that happened on the cross, it's because we only have time to get through those things, right? Lots of things happen in baptism. Three of them that we think. Inclusion, initiation, forgiveness, and union. And so we'll talk about that in um, just a minute. But that's an important question, because... Right? There's this thing, a lot of times, people from the community, people who aren't part of the church, they'll come up and be like, I need to get my baby did. Right? They're like, my baby's born, like I'm afraid they're going to die. Like, Okay, we need to calm down a little bit. But we actually, there's a rite in the prayer book um, called, it's the emergency baptism. That anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. Because we do have an understanding that it does do that. Right? It's not the only understanding, but there's an understanding, and so... A lot of times seminarians, like we work in hospitals, we do this chaplaincy um, internship thing, and um, I didn't have an emergency room, but a lot in the hospital I worked in, but a lot of seminarians have their experience of baptizing a baby who's going to die. Right? And they did, anybody can do it. Y'all can find it in the prayer book. Um, baptism under special circumstances. If that baby or that person survives, then like go get them to a priest. Um, but there's this understanding that in those moments of distress, there is something saving in the act of baptism. And so um, we don't see it as quite the quid pro quo, like if you're not baptized, you're not going to heaven kind of thing. <clears throat> we don't see it as, as that, right? And that we'll get into like what is a sacrament even. Um, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But, but we do have that understanding of baptism. There's one more hand and then we'll keep going. Did I answer your question already? Yeah. Okay. This was proposed to me, um, the way it was explained to me, that the baptism is like a combination of an air tag and a bat phone. You have the bat phone so you can call in, and you have the air tag so it's easier for God to, like, know where you've wandered off to. Yeah, I love that. Um, is, is it okay when, when we make, an, like, when we make analogies to sacraments like that, is that, is that okay? Like, sure. We don't, we don't understand any of this stuff, right? So what is a sacrament? The prayer book, which we'll have prayer books in here next time so we can look at them. The prayer book says a sacrament is an outward and visible sign, outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. All of these are things that happen inside. And the outward sign is the sacrament, baptism. We'll talk about that more deeply in a minute, right? 
marriage. Right? Marriage is an outward invisible sign of two people who are already deeply in love with them. What changes in marriage? Taxes. Taxes. Yes, right? In some sense, sacraments are us catching up to what's already happened. Right? Gavin was everything he needed to be a priest was already there. And the church caught up with it when we ordained him. Right? Taxes also changed when you became a priest because, you know, there you go. But so maybe sacraments are just a, a tax scheme. Um, but no, sacraments are may, maybe it's us catching up with what God's already doing. Confession. It's an outward invisible sign. God's already forgiven you. God already knows the bad things you're going to tell me. But it's a way for us to physically act out what's already happening happening spiritually. All of them are like that. Confirmation, you're standing up and you're reaffirming. But there's already something stirring in you that's leading you to do that. <coughs> and so the sacrament is just us, the bishop, the church, catching up with that. All of those. Baptism is just like that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Gavin, did you have your hand up? No, nope, you got it. All right. So whenever, especially if we're like a parent of kids, what role does the parent's decision say, hey, is the kid ready for baptism? <laughs> Um, yes. Because, <laughs> like, when you, when you bring that infant, they have literally no say. After that, sometimes it's because the kid is like, I'm interested in this. And I love when, like, an elementary school-aged kid starts to bug their parents about getting baptized, right? Because something, they, they're still, right? But there's something that they want to. And so they're... At what age does it become like paternalism for the parent to say, now I'm going to take you to get baptized? What makes it different when they're eight than when they were eight days old? I don't know. There's not an answer, and I'm sorry. Um, but we don't force people to be baptized. Well, there's the flip version. Like, at what point do you say, do you understand what you're signing up for? Like, how much buy-in? Yeah, that's it. If they if they want, and that gets into communion, and you're teaching about Eucharist. If a kid puts their hand out, I'm going to put bread in their hand. And sometimes parents look at me like, I wish. But there's something in that kid that's yearning, like I want this, right? We can have the conversation about what it is later. But if a kid's like, I want to do this, we'll do it. Well, baptism isn't a prerequisite for. Everybody's welcome at God's table. Right. So, so here, here's what we're going to say. This is recorded. Um, our canons, our, okay. our church law, the uniform code of clergy justice. You have to be baptized. Yeah. Communion is reserved for, for um, baptized Christians. And there's scripture for that, right? And maybe we'll get to this in Eucharist, but it gets in with baptism as well. There's scripture. Right? They talk about like those who like don't know what's going on in communion, they're condemned. Like there, there's an understanding that like we're not just giving this stuff out willy nilly. Right? I think uh, someone who's not baptized who's moved by the Holy Spirit to come forward and put their hands forward, that's not willy nilly. And so um, our practice here is I. Now you're going to listen to me differently on communion when I say everyone's welcome at God's table. I then go through and tell you how to receive communion because maybe you've never done it before. I also say, if it's not your custom, come forward and cross your arms. I would love to pray God's blessing over you. I don't know if you've been baptized, right? Uh, one time in my life, I did know because maybe I've shared this story before. When Elizabeth's uh, mom, my former mother-in-law, when she died, her best friend in the whole world uh, is Jewish. And I see what's happening. I'm serving at the altar, and I see the whole family coming forward. And yes, yeah, she's coming up to receive communion. I'm getting ready. I'm going to pray with her, right? Like, I get it. No. I come by. She puts her hands up. I'm like, come on. <laughs> You're putting me in this position. But in that moment, she needed that. She wanted that. I've never knowingly, other than that, 
given someone communion who wasn't baptized. But in that moment, if you're gonna bring me up on Title IV charges for giving someone the body and blood of Christ, then like I, I have other marketable skills. <laughs> uh, but but the canons baptize Christians. Some churches, like I was raised Missouri Synod Lutheran, um, I can no longer receive communion there. I am a preacher, and I can't receive communion because I'm no longer Missouri Synod. So we, in our tradition, we talk about closed um, table. Now I'm stealing all your stuff from the Eucharist yeah, week. I have completely lost the thread here. We'll get to baptism. We practice close communion, technically, which means baptized Christians can receive communion. Some traditions, close communion means our type of Christian. Like the and Catholic I, Church. Yeah, Catholic, Catholic Church. Catholic mm -hmm. yeah. that and that's, I respect that, right? Like, if I go now, I used to go, when I would go to church with my mom, one of my best friends in the world is her pastor, and Pete is not going to deny me communion. And so I would go forward. It's a new pastor. I don't know him as well, and so I wouldn't go forward if I go to church with her. Because I respect that, right? Like, I don't want to offend anyone or put them in a position. Um, but yeah, baptism's not a requirement for that. Sorry, baptism is a requirement for that. That's Freudian slip, Bishop, because uh, I know you're going to watch it. Baptism is a requirement, but it's unenforceable, right? We're not checking cards at the door. All right. Um, scripture, so why do we baptize? Uh, number one, because Jesus told us to, Matthew. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Magic words. Jesus doesn't tell us how to do a lot, right? Jesus literally told the disciples, you go and figure it out for almost everything. He did tell us how to baptize. And so we do have some magic words. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so some of this, we do it because it's one of the only things Jesus told us what to do and how to do it. And so we keep doing it. It's also a response. Peter in the early church, he stood up, gave this really rousing sermon, and everyone wanted to be baptized. They had that response, right? So it's not just that Jesus told it to go do it. Sometimes it's just what we want to do, right? Um, baptism was around. Jesus was baptized, so it's not just like a Christian invention, right? Jewish baptism is different, but we get this practice from Jesus. It's something that was part of their tradition. And so when people were so moved by the Holy Spirit, they wanted to do that. And it's something that the apostles, Peter and his buddies, knew to do because Jesus told them to do it. So why do we do it today? One, because Jesus told us to do it. Two, because it's a natural response when we're moved by the Holy Spirit. Is that set up? Why? Okay. Now we're back on track. Sacrament of inclusion, forgiveness, and union. King. Where does the water come in? Where does the water come yeah, in? Why, why, why do you have to have holy water for the baptism? Um, because that's how it was done, right? Because it's a, it's a ritual wa cleansing. It's a ritual washing is where it comes from, right? Like most faith traditions have this. You think about uh, Muslim folks washing themselves before prayer, Jewish folks washing themselves before entering the temple, all of that. Some of it is that's how it was done. That's how Jesus modeled it for us. Yeah. Look. I think I would have heard Pete ask was holy water. You know, when it was originally baptism was in a river somewhere, which wasn't holy water since that we uh, have holy water today yeah what I heard. yeah and so that um, what is holy water our holy water is here because someone brings me a jug of water and I say a prayer over it right right, right? or we say a prayer at the thing I understand that. it some places will sell you holy water right like I don't know about that like there's this thing um, we consecrate things like there's prayers to consecrate things. There's official things that like a bishop can come and like, boom, this is now an altar, right? There's also this this idea things are consecrated by use. Like if we have a table right here, we can have communion around this table, even though no bishop has ever consecrated it, because it's consecrated by use. Water, if in a perfect world, right? Like we can have water that we've prayed over. We've reminded ourselves of the living water, right? Going back to the living water idea. We've talked about how water has served as a metaphor and a literal barrier and a cleansing mechanism throughout scripture. Like we go through that in the prayer. Some of it's reminding that. It's not magic words to make the water different. It's more to remind us of things. That's where that comes in. All right. 
So we're going to talk through, this is the prayer of the water. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. And this is the bit where, like, Io then starts pouring the water, and he's got the timing down, right? It's perfect. When I finish this prayer, he's out of the water. I don't know how he does it. So we go through this prayer. And remember what we said, in this prayer is all of our theology. We talk about initiation, we talk about forgiveness, we talk about union. Initiation, we bring into this fellowship those who come to him in faith. Part of initiation is, or part of baptism is initiation. It's, we, at the end, right, we either hold the baby up or the other person like stands there and we say, welcome the newly baptized. And then we all say together, we receive you into the household of God. Proclaim with us Christ crucified. Right? That's like you are a part of us. I said confirmation is not a requirement for anything in the church. Baptism, you're a part of the church. If you're baptized, you're a member. If you're baptized, you can run for vestry. If you're baptized, you can do anything. You're a full member because it's that sacrament of initiation. And you're also, it's not just like St. Martin's. This is initiation into the church. Your question if you're baptized here, you're baptized over there. Right? If you're baptized here, you're baptized in the Catholic Church. If you're baptized here, you're baptized in the Orthodox Church. Right? It's, um, it's like some people go take the bar exam in some states because you get multiple states. Right? It's reciprocal, reciprocity. Right? Baptism is like that. Right? When we're baptized, it's recognized by other traditions because it's that um, one act of initiation. Why are there two terms, uh, christening and baptism? It's I don't know. The thing, it's the same thing. I think. Baby, maybe baby christening, baptism, not baby. Yeah, I, there's probably an answer to that. Um, there's other faiths that you can be baptized into, and so they wanted to differentiate the fact. Yeah, and there's um, yeah, christening. I hear that a lot in the Catholic Church, um, but it's water baptism. Um, then we get to the forgiveness pit. We pray through his death and resurrection uh, from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We are cleansed from sin. We say we are cleansed from sin. There is an aspect of this that is that ritual washing. It's not magic, remember, because this is an outward invisible sign of something that's already happened. We're not like literally cleansing from sin. We're recognizing the reality that we're forgiven by Jesus. And this is an outward invisible sign of it. It's a, a performative thing, almost. So there, it's forgiveness. The last one, union. This is union. Remember, initiation gets us into the church. Union gets us union with Christ. Right? It goes beyond just we're part of the church. We're actually part of Christ. We say we're buried with Christ in his death. We share in his resurrection. We continue forever in the risen life. Because baptism is not like a once and done thing that just takes care of things in the past. There's an aspect of the forgiveness. There's an aspect of the cleansing of sin. But it's also union into something that's going forward. Right? It's not just something that happens when we're eight days old. Our baptism is an ongoing thing. That even we 44-year-olds continue in the baptized life. We continue in the risen life. And so it's, it is just a moment in a person's life. But it's a moment that sets off something else and continues something else into the future. All right. We got like seven minutes for questions about baptism. That's kind of a theology of baptism. We can talk about the practicalities. We can talk about other things. What, what questions do you all have about what we do, how we do it? We covered it all? Yes. Yeah. So you can only get baptized here in the bishop's No. You can get baptized here any time you want. Oh, okay. That's another thing. Some churches, there are high holy days. Some churches reserve baptisms for four holy days. I get those understandings. If you tell me you want to get baptized right now, we'll figure out how to do it at 1030. Right? Like, what is to prevent? No. The altar guild is not going to prevent us from getting baptized. Or whatever it is. And so people, like... Because there's also the practical reality of it is like, I want grandma to get here for a baptism. Grandma can't get here on one of these four prescribed weeks, right? So we'll do it on another week. If you want to get baptized, we'll do it here. Confirmation, the bishop does. So confirmation, reception, reaffirmation, that's when the bishop comes. Baptism can happen. That's something Gavin and I can do. That's something I have to do. 
I like to just say that I really appreciate hearing everybody's welcome to God's table. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've been to other churches. You know, I've belonged in other churches. You know, as you, I'm not welcome back to the table. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know a lot about other churches, but that may, it's a big thing, big event. Good. And I hear that, right? Like we do um, funerals here and people come from all different traditions for funerals. And I give that same spiel every time. And I hear from folks that they're like, you know, I wanted to normally receive communion, but you made it so welcoming, right? And some of that is that's, that's the practice of this place. Like I'm catching up with what y'all are doing, right? And so to, for us to offer that invitation to people, um, yeah, it's great. I love it. Yeah. This is probably a stupid question, but I, I think of uh, infants being cleansed of sin through baptism, and it's because of the sin of, of co conceiving this child, and the child's born through sin, and that's yeah. why an infant has sin, or uh, is an infant, does an infant have sin? Uh, I've raised two kids. They they come out of the womb knowing how to sin. <laughs> uh, no, that... What is, what is sin, right? No, what is sin, right? Do they, like, are they dirty? Are they, they're human, and so they're broken, and so they fall, like. Because they're born human. They, yeah, they, they're because born sin, sin. sin is not in action. Actions can be sinful. Sin is a condition, right? And so we are all born into the human condition, which is fallen and broken and hurting, not because of anything we do, but because it's just who we are, and we all know it, right? Like, we all just, like, the world's broken. We don't need to teach on that. We just experience it. It's the reality of that. Like, we're not like, oh, you, baby, you've done bad things, and so we need to cleanse you, right? It's we know you're born into a broken world. You are going to be so consumed in this world because it's the air we breathe, right? If we're fish, it's the water we swim in. We don't know any different than sinfulness and brokenness. And so part of it is that. It's recognizing that by virtue of being human, this kid's broken. Yeah. And was that the definition of original sin? Uh, yeah, you know, so... You, know, you can add that one next one. No, original, yeah, that is the broken human condition. If you want to take... Um, we'll get to Bible next week, and I'll talk about myth. And not like we're making up dragons as some fake thing myth, but myth is founding story. Our founding stories are myths. They're found in Genesis, right? And so we have this story of Adam and Eve. Were they a real person? I don't know how that biology works out, but whatever. Let's take it for granted. And so Adam and Eve, our origin story is they fell because people who were writing our origin stories knew the world's broken. Everyone around me is crazy. We have to be sinful. And so we're going to come up. It happens. There's a thing called original sin because we know, like, who was, did you sin first? Did I sin first? Who did it? We know somebody did it. And so we wrote down here, the world is broken and it has an origin. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Biology maybe doesn't check out. We'll talk about that next week. Sam, last question. You said that humans are born into a sinful condition. Does that mean Jesus was born into a sinful condition? No. He was born into a sinful world. This, yeah. So um, we're going to talk at Christmas time. We're going to talk about the incarnation and what it means. There's this whole deal, right? Like Mary, this miraculous birth. Right, and we talk about that as well when we talk about Bible next week. Right, Jesus' conception was different. Is how we as Christians, the teaching of the church is that Jesus' conception was different, and so Jesus was born outside of that human. He was born into it, but he, as fully God, fully man, somehow was born outside of it. You're looking at me like you're not buying it. And that's a good thing. That's good, thing, right? We don't know how. Some of this is like... Believe, just believe it. What does Gavin say? We believe God. God, God, became a baby. That's his line. I love it. We believe God became a baby. So if people say... If we want to say other people's beliefs are crazy, right? Like, you're, you're picking up on the fact that we believe some things that, like, they don't make sense. The biology doesn't check out. The way we understand it. Right, God became a baby in the person of Jesus. Somehow that took him outside of that. 
you're still not buying it, and I love it. All right. And that what faith is? Uh, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the understanding of things unseen. Yeah? We don't have to understand it. I blame the Enlightenment for your question. We have to figure these out. Everything has an answer because of the Enlightenment. Transparency. Right? Every, we're smart enough. We're going to figure it out. Aristotle, like, told it. Like, all of it. We can, we can solve anything. That's not the way our understanding of the world, at least in here, operates. There's a lot we can... There's a lot we can figure out, and a lot we figure out supports the things we believe, but faith isn't a math problem that we can figure out two plus two equals something else. That's the wrong way to look at it. Um, and we all, like, I can tell you why the sky's blue. It's because of the refraction of the light at a certain angle and the blah, blah, blah. But, like, why do we find that appealing? Like, when the sun goes down, there's going to be changes in the atmosphere that cause the colors. That explains what happens, but why? Why do we find it beautiful? We're never going to figure that out. And so there's things, even in our own experience, that we know we can try to figure out why, what happened. We're never really going to know why. And I think you're getting at a question. And we'll talk about it next week when we talk about like the creation stories and the, the genres of scripture. Some of it, like we're the ones, when we talk about interpretation, a literal understanding of Genesis is a relatively new invention. Figuring out an understanding of Genesis as like a newspaper or a science textbook is a relatively new thing. We'll talk about that next week. All right. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.